with it. Um, just before I introduce our speaker for the evening, I want to note that um, on the back table there is an e-newsletter sign up and if you'd like to learn more about lectures like this as well as other free programming that takes place at the museum, we don't spam you, we just send out an e-newsletter once a month and you're welcome to sign up. And if you're interested, um, we also have information about our membership back there as well. We have some membership brochures out. But um, the reason why I'm here is because I am pleased to introduce Professor Denise Phillips of UT's history department, who will be speaking this evening. Um, Professor Phillips specializes in the cultural history of science in the 18th and 19th centuries, particularly in German-speaking Europe. And she is here this evening to present the lecture, The Most Popular of Sciences, Natural History Through the Centuries. And this lecture is part of programming that's associated with our exhibit upstairs in our temporary gallery, Birds, Bugs, and Blooms, Natural History Illustration from the 1500s through the 1800s. And if you haven't had a chance to see the exhibit just yet, because I know Professor Phillips will be um, addressing so many of the ideas that are in that, it will be up through January 4th. So that's the perfect thing to do with your family or visiting relatives um, or friends during the holiday season. Um, we will be closed on Thanksgiving, um, but otherwise we're open most every day, seven days a week. Um, Professor Phillips received her PhD from Harvard University in 2004, and since then has received many awards for her research and many publications on the history of science. Um, and we're very, very pleased to have her here tonight. So welcome. All right, everybody, welcome, and thanks a lot for coming tonight. I was really excited when Kat asked me to do this this summer, um, and excited to learn that, they, uh, that the McClung Museum was putting on an exhibition on the history of natural history, um, which happens to be one of my own core intellectual interests. Um, and it's also something, as I'm going to be talking about with you tonight, that I feel a fair amount of um, also sort of personal passion and excitement about, um, and one might even say, as I'm about to uh, describe, I might even have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about being a historian of natural history. Um, and part of that has to do with what that meant um, when I was being trained in the field of history of science in the late 1990s and the early knots, um, which was right about the time that the history of natural history was becoming a sort of respectable thing to do in the history of science. Before the 1990s, um, there were very few people in the history of science that worked on this topic, um, and that wasn't by accident. It was because the people that founded the field in the United States, um, people like the emeritus professors in my own department, um, the graduate department at Harvard in the history of science who started the place up in the 1950s, their primary allegiance, disciplinary allegiance, was to physics. A lot of them had PhDs in physics. And when they created the history of science as a discipline, um, they wanted physics and that model of knowledge to be at the core of what the history of science was going to be about as a discipline. Um, and if you press them, I think a lot of these guys would have agreed with this very famous quote by the British nuclear physicist Ernest Rutherford. All science is either physics or stamp collecting. And natural history, um, in the eyes of a lot of them, was about the worst kind of stamp collecting you could find. So they saw it as a very low prestige activity um, and something that wasn't really worth their attention. Um, and this was something that, it was an opinion that wasn't just a kind of intellectual commitment, it was a sort of vehement personal commitment. Um, and to give you an example of this, there was a panel at the History of Science Society meeting in about 2004, where there were three young scholars, luckily I wasn't one of them, um, who work on the history of 18th century natural history, who gave papers on their work and then asked um, a eminent senior scholar of 18th century science to comment on their papers. 
And um, I know some of you in here go to academic conferences, and usually panel discussions um, are, you know, pretty mild. Occasionally, somebody will get a little ruffled, but these don't tend to be events that inspire strong emotion. Well, this eminent senior scholar stood up to give his commentary um, and said a few mildly polite things about how the papers had been reasonably well written and obviously fairly well researched. But, he said, I don't see what any of this has to do with science. And then proceeded for 10 minutes to explain all of the ways in which the things that these people had been talking about had nothing whatsoever to do with physics. Um, and luckily, there were enough historians of biology in the audience that um, he could be well countered. But um, that gives you a, a taste of, I think, the, um, the sort of uphill battle that the, the people ahead of me who, who started actually working on this stuff and trying to get people to take it seriously um, among historians of science, the, the kind of uphill battle they were facing. So I titled this talk, um, The Most Popular of All the Sciences. Um, and that was something 30 years ago that would not have been seen as a compliment, right? That was part of natural history's low profile, was that it was kind of popular, supposedly very easy, something sort of anybody could do. Um, now I think that uh, the fact that natural history was, for much of the modern era, extraordinarily popular is seen as something that's a strength and that's something we need to take seriously um, when we're considering why it matters historically. So until the 1990s, a lot of what um, times when historians of science would sort of unavoidably have to talk about natural history, they tended to do it in a fairly dismissive way. For example, the period I work on um, in the 18th century, there was a literature on, the, on scientific societies and associations in the Enlightenment. And those societies did a lot of natural history, so historians who were writing about them kind of had to talk about that. Um, but they were clearly sort of dismayed. Um, to find so many people interested in these things that seem to them not really worthy of the title of science. Um, and often described people who were doing this sort of thing as people who just sort of didn't get it. So there are two things I want to talk about tonight. One is the origin of this quite dismissive view of the natural history tradition. So one of the things we ask as historians is when people hold these convictions, where did they come from? Um, why did people develop these uh, strong and derisive opinions about the natural history tradition? Um, but that comes actually at the end of my story, in the end of my talk. Uh, the main thing I want to talk about is why people supported and liked natural history um, in its heyday, in the period where it was extraordinarily popular and prestigious which starts in the Renaissance and goes through about the mid-19th century. Um, and part of the reason that I wanted to do this is because it gives me a chance to give you guys a sort of overview of the historical work that's been done on the history of natural history over the last um, 20 years or so. So what I want to focus on specifically for the purposes of this talk um, are why people through the past five centuries considered this kind of knowledge, natural historical knowledge, important. Why they supported it, what other kinds of causes it linked up with. Um, because after all, one of the basic facts of knowledge production is that science and scholars have to eat. And the history of science is full of people who made great sacrifices through their work, ruining their health, spending their fortunes. Um, but to really become a going concern, a kind of knowledge that matters in the world, Science needs support um, and interest from people who have power and influence and money. So that's a lot of the story I'm going to be telling tonight, where that social support for natural history came from. But before I get to that, um, I know there are uh, some students in the audience, I think some people maybe from uh, Dr. Wu's world history course, and I wanted to just briefly describe what this term natural history means. Um, if you've ever gone to a natural history museum, you have some working idea of what it refers to. Um, you know, it's a term that is used to describe the study of animals, plants, and minerals. Um, something that people can find kind of confusing about the term is um, the word history in it. Um, and this label, natural history, actually preserves 
an older meaning of this term, one that dates back to the Greek term historia, which means something roughly like description. So natural history is the science that studies, um, that gives descriptions of specific kinds of plants, animals, and minerals. I also wanted to give you a sense of where natural history fits in the intellectual universe um, over the periods that I'm talking about. So I wanted to show you this highly detailed map of knowledge. And you probably can't read the fine print from where you are. Um, but the, the main relevant points you should be able to see. So you see that over there on the far end, there's a group of disciplines that are labeled history. And those include civil history, so the kind of stuff that people in the history department do now, um, but also natural history. And then there's another big group of disciplines lumped at, together as philosophy. Um, and the difference for people really from the Renaissance through the middle of the 19th century between a discipline that was a historical discipline and a philosophical discipline um, was that history dealt with specific things and philosophy dealt with general causes. So if you were interested in general causal knowledge, you were doing philosophy. If you were interested in studying you know, specific stuff, you were doing history. Um, this particular map, just so you know, is taken from the mid-18th century. But that basic division is one that's already there in the Renaissance. Um, and it's pretty stable, particularly in the English-speaking world, well into the, 19th history, uh, into the 19th century. So there are a couple of things I want to point out about this map before I move into more about the specifics of the history of natural history as a field. Um, you'll notice, as I've already said, natural history is grouped with human history. So in the time period I'm going to be talking about, um, the two cultures that we often talk about, the difference between the science and the humanities. That is a really an important touchstone in ordering people's sense of the intellectual universe. Um, that's a concept that really only emerges in the middle of the 19th century. So um, people see a lot of analogies between the study of human history and the study of nature. Um, and the, all, these fields, are, their history is deeply interconnected um, in all kinds of ways. The second thing I wanted to point out, um, you know, I was talking about how people look down on natural history. Um, even in its heyday, that was true to a certain extent. Um, because philosophy, since it dealt with general causes, um, was seen as the more prestigious form of knowledge. So in certain settings and in certain contexts, natural history um, was seen as a sort of second rank form of knowledge. Um, there were particular cases in the 15th, 16th, 17th century where there mattered, this mattered, but also a lot of settings in which it didn't, where the fact that some grumpy old university professor would tell you that philosophy was better than history didn't really matter a hill of beans. And those are mostly the kinds of settings I'm going to be talking about for the rest of my talk. So our story starts in the Renaissance which is when natural history emerges as a recognizable field in European culture. And this happens as a result of three intertwining developments. The first of these is actually something that's going on in the humanities, in the study of um, texts, the humanist revival, which is an intellectual movement to attempt to recover, fully recover, the knowledge of the ancient world, of classical Greece and Rome. So one of the things that first leads people to get interested in natural history is reading ancient authors that wrote on this topic, like Pliny or Theophrastus. Um, and the leaders in this movement are often people who are trained in medicine at European universities and who are looking back at these ancient texts, particularly about plants, um, trying to recover lost ancient medical knowledge. So the very first botanical gardens in Europe, for example, are often founded by people who are really interested in studying the classics and who are trying to figure out um, what plants exactly these ancient authors are talking about. And that's not always self-evident. 
um, in part because different plants grow in Greece than grow in, say, Germany. So um, a lot of the, the plants being discussed um, in these ancient works aren't familiar um, to people living in other parts of Europe. So a lot of things that become central to the practice of natural history come out initially of this attempt to recover lost ancient wisdom. There's also something new um, and exciting and expansive going on in Europe in this time period um, from the perspective of people who are interested in the natural world, and that is Europe's colonial and commercial expansion around the, the globe. So another thing that these learned physicians who are founding botanical gardens and who are getting really interested in natural history are trying to do is to figure out how to slot all of these new reports about the new world, better reports about um, what exists in the East, all kinds of new products that are flooding into Europe, into their view of the world, um, into their medical practices in a lot of cases, um, and that proves to spur a lot of interest in the study of nature, too. And there's some really important plants, as you probably all know, that enter Europe in this time. Maybe the most important um, is the potato, which Europeans encounter for the first time in the second half of the 16th century. And by the, no, the 19th century, is a staple of the European diet. The third and final strain that helps to support natural history as an activity is its development as a courtly kind of knowledge. That is, a knowledge that noblemen and women and, that, and rulers are interested in. Now, to give you guys a little bit of political background, um, the Renaissance um, and the 17th century, um, is these, these are centuries where in a variety of ways, European rulers are trying to expand their power um, to get better control over their nobles, um, often to consolidate their territories. And um, one of the ways that you project power in Europe in this time period is by creating a very beautiful, luxurious, and sophisticated court. And Natural history fits into that culture, or comes to fit into that culture in a number of ways. One of them is through the creation of things that are called uh, cabinets of curiosity. Now, princes and kings had collected expensive and rare things already in the Middle Ages, and this becomes a practice in the Renaissance that's much, much more widespread. Um, and this is a great example of what a collection would have looked like in the 17th century. This one belonged to a nobleman from Bologna, um, who was an important diplomatic liaison with the Medici's Florence. Um, and there are a number of interesting things from our perspective about this collection. Um, and it, this image is very similar to one that you'll see upstairs as well of um, another collection, um, from a, a physician's collection from the same century. You'll see that the, th the um, different objects are arranged not by, they're not grouped by type in the way you would see them in a modern natural history ex, um, museum. They're arranged um, in sort of aesthetically pleasing forms, and they're quite intentionally all mixed up. Um, and they're mixed up in a number of ways from our perspective. So you see in this image natural objects, there are also weapons um, and uh, other sorts of man made objects. You see a dagger down there. There's um, a human member of the collection. There was a dwarf that this nobleman kept at his court um, to display as a curiosity to visitors. And this was actually not an uncommon practice for particularly wealthy people to actually have live human beings um, in their cabinets of curiosity. Um, and Part of the reason that things are sort of so mixed up and so diverse in this collection has to do with the way that these spaces were supposed to be used. So what this kind of cabinet was supposed to do for a ruler or a noble a man or woman um, was to give them a place that they could contemplate the diversity of the world with all of its multitudes of connections. Um, so this was supposed to be what at the, in this period is called a microcosm, that is a little world that 
represents all of the multiple relationships you might find in the bigger world. And for people in the, in the Renaissance, the kinds of relationships they were interested in finding in nature and in human culture um, were rather different than what later naturalists would want to pursue. People in the Renaissance see nature as imbued with moral, political, and also religious symbolism. Um, they think about it in a lot of cases as a kind of divine code waiting to be cracked. Um, and one of the historian William Ashworth has argued that one of the reasons that natural history uh, fits so well into court culture is because it merges really well with um, a culture of uh, emblems, which were very important in noble self-presentation. Um, and this is an example from a 17th century work of an emblem using an animal. Um, and the, the thing on top says, the big eats the little, which was a kind of rule of politics um, in the 16th and 17th century in a lot of ways. Um, but this gives you a sense of the sort of multiple levels at which people were encountering plants and animals in this time period. So there were useful things um, that you might eat or take as medicine, but they also had all of this political and religious meaning as well. Um, and they fit very nicely into the evolving luxury culture of the European upper classes. And this is two examples. This is a particularly famous tulip. Um, this, uh, tulips were a favored luxury flower in the 17th century. Um, and this is a, a shell made into a very elaborate gold cup. Um, and this is something you would have found in a lot of royal or noble collections um, between about the 15th and the 17th century. All right. So that gives you a sense of some of the broader cultural reasons that people were getting interested in natural objects and in creating collections. Oh, this is another um, beautiful image uh, from one of the artists represented upstairs, Maria Sibylla Marion, um, who um, created a book of insect and flower drawings um, and did so from a, a scientific trip she took to Suriname with her daughter, which is a very unusual event in the 17th century, a singular event, in fact, for a woman to travel. Um, and part of the reason she was able to fund her trip was because there was a well-paying audience for these sorts of images. Um, so what's the payoff of all of this in terms of some of the more familiar things that historians of science care about? Well, one of the results of the body of research I've just been describing to you, so the people who have looked at the history of natural history in this time period and have tried to figure out why people got so interested in it. Um, one of the things that this has led to is a real reevaluation of what we think happened in the 17th century set of events that we now call the scientific revolution. Um, you guys, if you're familiar with the scientific revolution as, a, an, as an event, what you probably know about are things like um, Galileo, um, Newton, so revolutions in cosmology and physics. And it used to be that that was mostly what historians of science talked about, too. Um, now that we know a lot more about natural history in this time period, there are a number of historians who um, have gone back and sort of asked themselves, well, if you ask people in the late 17th century what they think is new in the sciences, what's revolutionary? A lot of what people would have talked about, these historians argue, are these developments in natural history. So what was important was not just that there were new ideas about astronomy or new ideas about physics, but also there was this whole culture now that just cared a lot more about specific material objects. And that's something that comes about because of natural history. And I put up here a picture of um, the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, which is one of the most famous organizations in the scientific revolution. Um, and a historian recently went back and counted what's actually in the proceedings. And it turns out there's very little physics and astronomy and a whole lot of natural history. So it turns out that this is really um, a defining body of knowledge for people in this time period, not at all marginal and unimportant. So there are a number of things that change in the second half of the 18th century as we head into the um, more recent past, into the 18th century. But there are a couple things that hold. One of them is that 
natural history keeps the social prestige that it first gained in the, or these earlier centuries as a kind of a courtly form of knowledge. It's an activity that carries a certain cachet and is a way that you can potentially form connections with influential people. It's also a body of knowledge that um, in this earlier time period got associated with things that rulers should know, knowledge that's useful for governing. Um, and that holds true going forward as well. And the other connection that holds true um, is this link between European expansion, both commercial and imperial, and the practice of natural history. So we'll move forward now into the 18th century, the era of the Enlightenment. Um, and I put up here, this is a picture of uh, Carl Linnaeus, who's probably the most famous 18th century naturalist, and probably the most famous event in 18th century natural history, which is his creation of the sexual system of botanical classification, which was this really nice, easy way to classify plants according to their sexual organs. Um, and it's not the, the system that botanists use today, but it's, it was a really um, nifty innovation that allowed a lot of people to learn botany really quickly in the 18th century. Linnaeus was um, a, a fascinating man, by all accounts kind of a grump and a homebody. Um, but ironically enough, he sent his students out into sort of every corner of the world um, to explore the natural history of far-flung places. And they send him back tons of specimens, and he creates this huge collection. Um, and he's one important person um, building up big natural history collections as a result of global travel in this time period. He's also somebody that typifies another 18th century motive for practicing natural history, namely improving agriculture. And um, this little seal here is actually from a Phil uh, Philadelphia Society for the Improvement of Agriculture. And I picked it just because I think it's kind of funny. Venerate the plow, um, which this is, could be a motto for a lot of people in the 18th century. They're really, really interested in improving agriculture. Um, up to the highest levels, you know, George III of England is nicknamed Farmer George because he's such an enthusiast for these kinds of things. And people have lots of wild plans in the 18th century about how they might use natural historical knowledge to transform agricultural production. So Linnaeus, for example, really hopes he's going to be able to teach coffee plants to, go, to grow in the cold Scandinavian climate so that um, Sweden will, won't have to buy this exotic product from far afield but can produce it at home. Um, that's an example of a, a project that doesn't work out some of the other things that they come up with, like, say, um, making the potato a widely planted plant work out better. The other thing that happens in the 18th century is that social interest in natural history continues to expand. And um, the slide I had up earlier of Linnaeus's sexual system of plant classification is one tool that helps that happen. Um, but there are lots of, there's a huge amount of, of effort that goes into making this work. Lots of books that are published um, and illustrations to help people learn how to identify different plants and animals. And people in the 18th century come to see natural history as an example of precisely the kind of rational, improving leisure activity that enlightened people ought to engage in. And they also take it up as part of a new kind of more middle-brow luxury culture. So, for example, in the 18th century, people arranged butterflies under, um, under glass in their sitting room. Um, and there are all sorts of ways in which it becomes a kind of um, display of taste to have a garden, for example, that's very botanically diverse and that has plants from lots of different places. So just as the um, courtly culture and noble culture in the earlier time period adopted natural history um, as part of their luxury culture, that continues to be true for a wider range of people in the 18th century. For people who are putting together scientific collections in the 18th century, the old sort of cabinet of curiosities model starts to wane and you see art objects and natural history objects now in, as part of separate collections by the end of the 18th century. One of the things that doesn't change, however, is that people in the 18th century still see natural history as something 
that is um, infused with aesthetic pleasure, that it's also about enjoying nature, not just understanding it. So Germans in the 18th century use um, a word, Naturfreund, friend of nature for naturalists. And I think that captures um, how people who are enthusiasts for this kind of knowledge see it as something that is um, about connecting emotionally with nature, um, not just uh, about understanding it better. So in many ways, the 19th century and the place of natural history in the 19th century continues a lot of the same themes. Um, and the first picture I wanted to show you is of a guy, Alexander von Humboldt, um, who is one of the most famous naturalists of the first half of the 18th century. Um, and he travels to South America as a young man. He it sort of gets this idea that he wants to go to South America um, when he's in his early 20s. And his mother is completely against it. And she holds the purse strings. So you know he's kind of sitting around northern Germany, um, hoping for a break, trying to find a way to travel. And thank goodness, mom eventually dies and leaves him. And that's how he feels about it, too. I'm not just saying that to be mean. <laughs> um, and he gets his um, inheritance. And he spends it to go to South America, um, does a massive amount of collecting, and spends the next couple decades after he gets back to Europe um, basically spending his entire fortune publishing the results of his scientific journal, of, of his scientific journey. Um, and his most famous accomplishment when he's in South America is that he's the first person, supposedly, or the, at least the first European who self-reports that he climbed to the top of Chimborazo, which is the highest peak in the Andes. Um, and he's, very, he's a great self-promoter. He writes letters to Europe immediately when he does this, telling them that he has climbed the highest peak in South America. Um, and becomes very famous and widely celebrated after he gets back for having done this. Um, apparently, by the 1840s, he was really boring people at the Prussian court with his travel stories. Otto von Bismarck, who's later the Chancellor of Germany, writes in his journal about, like, oh, I had to listen to Humboldt tell his Chimborazo story again at dinner. Um, but part of what Humboldt's fame can tell us about the place of natural history in 19th century culture is um, the fact that it was possible to become famous for producing really a, a sort of couple travel descriptions um, and a bunch of really dense botanical uh, works. He's a, a recognizable face all over Europe, um, widely celebrated, um, and in a way kind of gets, a, a, and that was, he was clearly someone who wanted that kind of glory. Um, so his, his, his spending of his inheritance um, paid off, in part because there's a broader European public that's really fascinated by exotic travel um, and it's looking to read precisely these kinds of things. And um, Darwin was actually a really big fan of Humboldt and um, claimed that his, um, some of his early work had a big impact on how he thought about nature. One of the other ways you can see the clout that natural history has in the 19th century is um, the building of museums like this. This is the British Natural History Museum, a, a real cathedral to science. And if you go to almost any European capital, um, they have a building, maybe not quite this grand, but a very grand building um, that they built to house their natural history collections. And part of the reason that countries put so much money into building these kinds of edifices is that these sorts of collections were important markers of national prestige. They spoke to the imperial ties that a nation had to its ability to bring together things from all over the world. Um, so this was an, adver uh, an advertisement of wealth and power at a national level, um, as well as something that was meant to serve science. The other thing that's really marked in the 19th century is that the process that started in the 18th of social expansion really just runs absolutely wild. So in the 18th century, there are a couple hundred different societies that deal with natural history. By the 19th century, there are thousands across Europe. In Scotland alone, there are 200, I think, in the 19th century, and that's not a huge area, but there um, are lots and lots and lots of little natural history and natural scientific societies across Europe by the end of the 19th century. And um, their members are 
really diverse and kind of modest in comparison to a lot of the people I've been mentioning before. So in England, for example, you have lo little local botanical clubs that are made up of artisans, weavers, um, the kind of people that are, are being de-skilled and pushed out of work slowly by the Industrial Revolution. Um, there's a little German Natural History Society that I studied for my first book. Their fa its founding members were um, a vinegar maker, a guy who made buttons, um, a couple school teachers, a drawing instructor. So you've got a huge new group of people in the 19th century who are organizing themselves in these societies and who want to stake a claim not just to learn things about natural history but in a lot of cases to also contribute. So these are people with ambitions to actually do science not just to um, to learn about it. And natural history becomes so popular that a lot of people Seem, start to see its very popularity as a problem. So for example, let me read you a quote from um, a guy named Ferdinand Oxenheimer who wrote a book in the early 19th century about the study of butterflies uh, who, that bemoaned how popular this pursuit had become. He wrote, entire armies of butterflies are captured and murdered every year without serving anything other than the demands of a passing fancy. That is, you've got these hordes of people now going out into the countryside, collecting insects, and doing God knows what with them. Um, and the poor butterflies, um, they'd be better off left alone. And you really can't find cases where um, you know, a particular type of plant or animal became suddenly fashionable in natural historical um, circles, and they just about picked certain areas of the countryside clean. For example, ferns, for some reason, become very popular in the 1850s in Britain. And there are areas near popular vacation sites where apparently there was not a fern to be found um, because people had gone out and gathered them all up. So by the second half of the 19th century, it's clear that natural history is becoming a victim of its own success in certain ways. Um, I talked earlier about how you know, being linked to rulers and, and noble people could be a real asset for a body of knowledge. Well, once you're linked to school teachers and vinegar manufacturers, your social cachet starts to sink. Um, and that's one of the things that's going on with natural history in the, um, in the 19th century, particularly by the second half. Um, Oh, and I should say, I, I didn't talk about this image. This is one of the things that all of those hordes of people are doing is studying regional natural history. So this is the big boom period for regional natural history. And this is a book by a Nuremberg engraver on um, an illustrated flora of Germany. Um, and it's a, a view of the fruit and leaves of the service tree, a uh, common Central European tree. So um, these are the sorts of, of books that all of those regional naturalists would have been consuming. So now we get to the origins of that dismissive view that I opened with, which really comes into full flower in the second half of the 19th century. And to illustrate um, the kinds of arguments people start making, I wanted to talk about a specific debate between two German figures that I've studied in my own work. One of them, Adolf Bastian, is a man who works at a museum and who is a fan of the natural history tradition. Emile du Barimont is an experimental physiologist who is not. <laughs> so both of these guys write speeches in the 1860s where they are memorializing Alexander von Humboldt, that naturalist I talked about earlier. And Bastian praises Humboldt to the skies, particularly because um, he is, according to Bastian, a fantastic exemplar of natural historical science. So he was an expert at comparing different objects um, in careful and scientific ways and ferreting out their various relationships. <coughs> Emile de Barimond, on the other hand, um, so he's giving his speech to the Prussian Academy of Sciences. Humboldt was Prussian. He's kind of a big local hero. There's a limit to how dismissive du Bois-Raymond can be, but he does a pretty good job um, at getting in lots of digs anyway. Um, he clearly doesn't think very highly of Humboldt um, and doesn't think that much that he did counts as real science. And that's because Du Bois-Raymond is a committed Newtonian. Um, he thinks things, the only things that count as real scientific insights are things that can be formulated 
as mathematical laws, general mathematical laws, and Humboldt didn't come up with any of those. So here we see two really distinct views of what si definitions of what science is and what counts as science. Um, and in at least elite scientific circles in the later part of the 19th century, Emile Dubois Raymond's version of science is starting to carry more weight than Bastian's. It doesn't take over completely, and that's one of the things that historians of biology have shown over the last couple decades. Um, so people who like natural history um, and who think that tradition is important don't disappear, but their relative importance in science um, does decline. And in part, this has to do with people like Dubois Raymond, who's a university professor, trying to establish themselves as fully professional scientists who are doing something very different from that huge community of people they're now calling amateurs who are in popular scientific societies. So a lot of the reason that they are so down on natural history is because it's the kind of science that's most common in these very broad popular circles. And they're really interested in distinguishing what they're doing um, from what you know, the pasture three villages down is working on. So this view that natural history was something that needed to be superseded, that wasn't fully scientific, was one that, um, as I, I told you at the beginning of the talk, the first generation of American historians of science inherited more or less whole cloth. Um, and a lot of the insulting things that, say, late or 19th century or early 20th century biologists would say about natural history were taken as simple fact. It was a kind of popular, easy form of knowledge that wasn't very impressive. Um, there are a number of ways in which recent research cuts against this kind of claim. We now have an understanding, as I said earlier, that the scientific revolution, a lot of what people understood as new and different um, in the period of the scientific revolution were really things that were coming out of natural history as well as out, as out of physics. If you look at the 18th and the 19th century, um, and you, tr you want to understand why people in these centuries cared about science, what kind of science they thought was useful and important. The answer is very often natural history. And there are also all sorts of ways um, that historians um, have seen this tradition continuing on in various branches of biology in the later 19th and early 20th century, um, even in cases where people are explicitly denying any, cl any connection. There's some other ways in which the little regional, often insulted regional naturalists I was talking about now seem to be kind of important. Europe's scientific societies play a really important role in the birth of the modern conservation movement in Europe. So some of the first people to notice when local bird populations or insect populations start to decline are these local naturalists who are spending a lot of time out in the countryside observing what's going on there. And they're some of the first people who care enough and are organized enough to try to do something about it. And I think that fact really speaks quite eloquently to the importance of the kind of knowledge that the natural historical tradition represented. Not knowledge of general causes, but knowledge of specific things and also often specific places. Um, and it's part of why I feel a, a sense of sort of um, passion and personal investment um, in this tradition that I study. I think that the derisive views of an older generation of historians of science are not just wrong-headed, but dangerous in certain ways. Um, because a lot of what we want to know about the world um, is how complex sets of causes operate in particular places. We want to know a lot about the world that isn't just general, but that is also very specific. And I think it's really important that we save a space in our scientific pantheon for people who did that kind of work. And appreciating the history of natural history, I think, is part and parcel of doing that. So thanks very much for coming tonight. Um, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have.
Yeah, that's a good question. So when does the collecting impulse? Um, I would say the first half of the 20th century. Um, I mean, although you can still, I mean, you can still buy this. You can buy pre-made collections. I mean, I think it never goes away completely. Um, so, and, and there's a big debate in the 19th century about whether or not it makes sense to have your own collection, if you're a serious naturalist, whatever that might mean. Um, so as big institutional collections develop, um, people who are uh, really interested in, in writing serious scientific work are better served by those large institutional collections. So a lot of them might give up trying to have a sort of general collection and maybe only have a personal collection that focuses on one narrow area. Or, um, so there's a, there's a lot of adjustment that goes on as large research collections are formed among people who are interested in being natural history authors. Um, but the, the kind of more popular collecting practices, I think, stretch into the 20th century. Um, and, and there's you know, things like pressing flowers, for example. I mean, that is something that can be a botanical practice and part of a formal um, collection, or it can be something that you're just sort of doing for fun and because it's pretty. Um, and often what that activity means to different people can be kind of fluid in different moments, um, right? Sometimes, I mean, a lot of stuff that's written um, on the education of children, for example, in the 19th century suggests that you do things like that with your children in part to train their aesthetic senses, but also to teach them a little bit about natural history. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in a way, so the first, um, there's sort of, the history of biology, as a, um, a sort of going pursuit is a, um, something that really gets going in the 70s and 80s. And it, there are two things that people study. One is the kind of experimental physiology that Emile Dubois Raymond was doing, so lab biology. Um, and the second is Darwin. And for, for obvious reasons, I mean, these are two examples of kind of grand theoretical programs um, that map better onto the models of knowledge that their colleagues in the history of, of physics. And they're also just important, right? I mean, <laughs> Darwinian <laughs> um, theory is enormously important to the history of biology. And there's, you know, that's the sort of first big boom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the, the existence of biology as a coherent discipline, as you say, really, that's a story that's largely the first half of the, the 20th century. And, um, you know, ecology is part of that history, but also the, mer the combination of genetics and evolutionary theory into a sort of single body of knowledge. Um, yeah, and I mean, one of the things that when I, I sort of said very quickly something about uh, people looking at continuities between this tradition and what's going on in biology around and after 1900, and um, one of my colleagues, Lynn Nyhart, just wrote a book on the early origins of ecology that argues that a lot of the, um, at least the early German thinkers who are working in this field are able to do the kind of work that they do um, because it, early in their careers, they're sort of stuck in these less prestigious places. So one of them starts off as a school teacher where he's doing a lot of regional natural history with his students um, and thinking about animals and plants in specific locations. Um, and that then later that's part of the setting um, out of which his ecological ideas develop. So that's um, kind of one strain of research is trying to see how these traditions connect. 
um, and the, the, some of the key concepts that help found the science of ecology um, are in part kind of de indebted to this, this older kind of, yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, although, I mean, I think historians of physics, 19th century physics and chemistry see the overarching framework of those disciplines changing quite a bit, um, right? I mean, the people that write about this Newtonian program that Emile Dubois-Raymond um, represents see that as something that's a kind of dead end, ultimately, right? Because then you get relativity theory and, um, and also thermodynamics in a lot of ways um, changes a lot of things about the, the scaffolding of physics. Um, but I think it is, it's, you know, um, I, th I think you're right that it is the absence of a unifying theory that makes this intellectually um, suspicious. And there are a number of people, you know, I mean, leading naturalists like Linnaeus, I mean, one of the things that he tries to do is argue that bot botany can also be a philosophical science. It can also be something that deals with general causes. Um, so this is a kind of ongoing program that leading naturalists are pushing. Um, throughout this time period, but a lot of what I think drove the broader social interest in it was um, bound up in, you know, really things that we would see as kind of mundane, like collecting um, and then describing uh, things that were in the immediate environment. Or yeah. What if you have any comments on uh, the role of the earth sciences during this period of time? Yeah, you can see in my own work, I focus a lot on the history of botany, so I tend to draw my examples from that. But there's a parallel story to be told about the history of mineralogy and geology, um, which is important to precisely these same audiences that I'm talking about because of mining. Um, so already in the Renaissance, rulers are interested in finding new mines. <laughs> um, and this becomes a more organized and concerted effort in the 18th century when they found mining academies. And um, some of the early big figures in geology, like Anton Werner, um, are in that s those settings. Um, and their careers are sort of funded by their ruler's interest in getting at mineral resources. Um, and you know, mineralogy is also something that's um, widely practiced and quite popular. Um, by the early 19th century, you can buy pre-made mineralogical collections. If you go to Freiburg, which is where Vanner's Mining Academy is, you can order them through the mail. Um, so yeah, it, it is part and parcel of that expansion as well. Yes, very much so. And um, I mean, the key figure in the 19th century is really the university professor. Um, and that is a, a model that, um, at, at least in general terms, kind of starts in Germany. State supported universities um, with professors that have a sort of special scientific status. And um, the British and the French at certain moments very self consciously copy that and argue that the state needs to be giving more concentrated support to the sciences. Um, so yeah, that link between state and educational institutions, which gets stronger in the final half of the 19th century, is really important. Um, and there's also, in, uh, in some cases, um, industrial interests help to found labs um, that are important sites of these new, this new professional scientific authority, too. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, and I bet you you probably know much, much more about this than <laughs> than I do. You know, that's I mean, um, these the museum, the collection, this is the the raw material of natural history. Um, and these big museums that get built in the late 19th and the early 20th century um, employ a lot of people and do um, you know a lot of important work in sort of public in defining what this um, field means for the public as well. Um, and I mean, one of the things that I, I mean, I guess I can answer that question partly from going to natural history museums. And um, I mean, there are a lot of places that have sort of updated their collections to try to give more, um, you know, interactive accounts um, that try to include more. Um, information about general biology, um, you know, displays that um, are organized around evolution. Um, and then there are a lot of places that still keep a lot of their old, like, late 19th or early 20th century um, exhibits that are, you know, stuffed animals um, in, like, natural settings. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I, I, I've never really talked to people in the museum world about those decisions and where that's coming from. It would be fascinating to know more about um, how those decisions get made. I mean, it's clear, I was just in New York a couple of months ago, and it's clear that um, those old exhibits still carry a lot of punch. Like, people love them, the, all of those old halls. And um, I think if, if someone tried to rip them out, there would be a real public outcry. That's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, there's this historian of biology that said that um, natural history is what 20th century biologists call those parts of the older life sciences they don't care about anymore. So, <laughs> like, there's most of the stuff does get, or the questions do get carried forward into, you know, evolutionary interest in diversity and geographic distribution and I mean, all sorts of things that um, are part of 20th century biology. Um, but at least in certain locations, the, the label becomes very uncool, you know? Um, although that seems to be changing, too. I mean, there, there's this new natural history division within the, um, yeah. So that, I, I think in a way, there are all sorts of things going on in the life sciences that you probably are, are very familiar with that maybe are um, making my story about uh, this being a, a low-ranking form of knowledge, potentially obsolete soon, which would be great. I mean, uh, you know, I think that seems very interesting. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah. So. Um, think how to tackle that. So I don't have a good, you know, my own specialty is in the 18th and the 19th century, so I don't have a good 30-second explanation of, of why cabinets of curiosity collapse out into their separate fields. Um, and I've read some things about that, but nothing that I found sort of totally convincing as an explanation. Um, I think at least in the materials that I work on, the moment that I see those separating um, is really in the second half of the 19th century when talking about aesthetic and emotional appreciation becomes coded as amateurish. Which is not to say that people don't still have those experiences, because a lot of elite biologists very clearly still do, if you look at their letters and journals. Um, but it becomes something you don't write about. Um, you know, it's very acceptable in the 18th century. These um, group of naturalists that I study in Berlin write effusive things about the pleasure of, um, of working with their natural history collections. Um, these words like volust, which is kind of like, it's like a really intense pleasure. <laughs> and, and, um, yeah, and, and talk a lot about themselves as connoisseurs of nature's beauty. I mean, there's a language of connoisseurship that survives, too. And, and that doesn't go away until the middle of the 19th century when, um, yeah, and, and I think it, it is related to this 
um, split, clear split emerging between professionals and amateurs, and certain kinds of experiences um, getting attributed to amateurs and, and not, no longer being at least part of the public persona of professionals. Allison. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the cases that I know best are the British and the German cases. And, and that's what, I, as I was writing sort of this summary, that's what I was thinking about. But you know, I think that um, it's not just, uh, the, it's going on in at least North America, too. Um, and you know, it's a good question how far it extends, because these kinds of activities certainly are present everywhere around the globe. Um, and, and not just practiced by Europeans by the early 20th century. You know, these are, these are activities, um, as, you know, as Chillen, <laughs> among others, have showed us that have been appropriated by all kinds of other people by the first half of the 20th century. Um, so yeah, this is a sort of uh, mostly European story, but I think there's a, a broader one out there as well. Any other questions? Oh, my pleasure.